Welcome back to Watchbox Studios. This is Watches Tonight, and I'm your host, Tim Masso. This evening, we are chatting about everything else that happened at Watches and Wonders, besides celebration and emoji dials. We are taking a look at viewer wrist shots, and of course, live interaction in the chat box. Sean is on the switcher. I hope everyone is ready for a great holiday. Really, this is the holiday after the holiday. As we approach Holy Days, we look back on Watches and Wonders the way you look back on Thanksgiving. The house is a mess, the guests are all gone, but the fridge is is full, and today we are feasting on those leftovers. Edward Ledden of Sweden, Matt Foster, Dave, Simon Holt, Arto Shaw from New York City, Andrew T, Enrique Cassiano, Miroslav, and Thomas Burnett, welcome in the box, guys. Visit thewatchbox.com for all of your luxury watch needs. You know I'm going to be browsing the Debitune pages, but we have over 3,000 pre-owned late model and vintage watches available at any given time, updating multiple times per day. Keep hitting refresh. Plus, you can join me on Instagram. I'm going to be heading to the New York Auto Show in this coming week, and my Instagram account is where you're going to see what I discover. It will be lots of fun, and we will share it together. But you're going to have to subscribe or follow Tim underscore Masso on Instagram to see it. All right, we got Jim Millett, John Goodman, Joe Pinto in Arlington. We've got Deach2086 in Western Massachusetts. Shane A is in the box along with... A Mick in Florida, Dave Oppenkar, Neo, JJ from Michigan, Mode Z from Singapore, and we've got Hippo Lord 215 and Bastion Potentier. Welcome, guys. Welcome, Bastion from Bermuda. Okay, wrist shots number one. I asked you answered. We're starting with John F. and his Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Chronograph screaming in the 2008 Ferrari F430, sending his regard to Watchbox's Matt Parker, from whom he has purchased several pieces. And thank you, John, for trusting our company. We have JMCE of Ireland, who shares a rare Audemars Piguet with the much-sought Ferrari 315S dial, car 532, a tribute to Ferrari's Mille Miglia 1957 First and second finish, very cool. We've got Luis Q and his Rolex GMT Master II capturing the beauty of the cherry blossoms in Osaka, Japan. Phil C and his Patek Philippe Aquanaut Travel Time watch, well, me on the stationary bike. That's a lot like how my day starts. We've got Wakar A and his Vacheron Overseas Self-Winding on an explosive factory rubber strap in what appears to be a BMW M car. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Who else is in the box? We've got Turkish Meister. We've got Mark S. from Brooklyn. We've got 23 Apasta 23, PT, Amit K. from Boston. Cullobsidian. We've got Patel Philippe. Nishant Patel, distinct two people, not one. And we've got Robert Taylor and Andreas in the box. All right, guys, keep it coming. Norm M., welcome to the show. So watches and wonders, here is our no Rolex event wrap up. I love Rolex, but it sucks all the air out of the room. And to an extent, so does Patek Philippe. So tonight we're gonna cover all the stuff that I thought was more interesting, including one Patek that I didn't manage to mention last week, because it's just a dial variation on a watch that's been with us a few years, but when it's a dial variation on a watch that is drop-dead gorgeous, the stuff of dreams, it's got to feature sooner or later. So step forward, the Patek Philippe 5316-50P001. Now this is the flagship of the 2023 novelties. Again, a variant. Recall that the Patek 5316-P debuted back in 2017 with a solid dial. So all we've done here is add a smoked sapphire dial to create a version of the original but my goodness does it make the difference. This thing is haunting. It includes a movement that is truly the Patek of your dreams. Look at that 14 karat gold hand-finished third wheel. It's like an octopus except it lacks three arms. But you could see hand-finished it takes seven to nine hours just to finish that piece. We have that steel batwing bridge for the tourbillon with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight interior angles mirror polished across the top. This is as good as it gets. All of that in black polished minute repeater strikers and the thing is super wearable. At 40.2 millimeters here in platinum, tech specs, limitless. You're getting a minute repeater. 
you're getting a tourbillon, you're getting a retrograde perpetual calendar, all of that in a watch case size that just about anyone can wear. Price, who knows? At what point, this watch's predecessor in steel set the record for a wristwatch at auction at over seven million for a charity sale, but this, in theory, should be made in more than one piece, so it's not gonna be a piece unique, but it will be very unique wherever you go. Expect to pay close to or above seven figures, and yes, it will be worth every penny. Jumping into the box, we've got Colin Harley from Cheyenne, Wyoming. I actually think that is the home, am I wrong, of the Union Pacific Big Boy, the world's largest ever steam locomotive. And we have Caliber YQG joining in with our group. We've got Matt Foster and Dark Star. All right, guys, welcome to the box, please. Let me know what you think of the watches from Watches and Wonders. Let me know what your favorites were and I'll read them off. Let's take a look at something else that struck my eye. Remember how the 2003 50th anniversary Rolex Submariner was nicknamed the Kermit? Well, here's the thing. Oris just pulled a power move with a Kermit the Frog themed Pro Pilot X. The date on the, well, at least the first of the month on the date disc is the famous Muppet's head and collar, and they're terming this an emoji. So now there is a Kermit the Frog emoji, and you can get it on your watch, and no, it's not the only emoji dial watch at Watches and Wonders this year. Very impressive tech specs. First of all, 39 millimeters in titanium. This is a watch we can all wear. Caliber 400 is an automatic and exclusive Oris movement with twin barrels. A five-day power reserve. It's protected down to 100 meters. It's 2,250 gauss, anti-magnetic. And impressively, are you listening, haute horlogerie? This one is a 10-year warranty. So for $4,600, you get a special Muppet branded box. It does mention the Muppets, originally a Jim Henson property, now evidently owned by Disney. Plus, you also get the opportunity to troll Rolex owners hard at your next office watch or red bar event. Let's see what you guys are saying in the box. 23 Aposta 23, please, no more emoji watches. We got Mark S mentioning that I am in fact wearing the System 51. This one is the System Frog. Although at this point, I wonder if we have to rename it the System Kermit. Am I obliged? Who else is in the box? We got Eric from California saying, hey Tim, sporting my Omega 57 today. What's this green watch? System 51, System Frog. A plastic watch made by robots. That's right, robots were already taking jobs before ChatGPT and before plagiarism became so easy in high school English class. What else is going on? Dixon Lee saying, my favorite from Watches and Wonders is the Alanga Unzona Odysseus chronograph. We have Lord with a passport. We have VCNA were by far the most impressive boutique at Watches and Wonders by far. Chopard and IWC next, JLC, not bad. We have Patel Philippe saying, I would like a Bill Sanders emoji. What else is going on here? We got Amit K saying, Tim, has Patek abandoned classic styles for the Calatrava? No, but expect more Calatravas in the coming years. It's definitely time for the line, and by that I mean the simple Calatravas to get some attention. The 5227 is age old and due for a replacement. I think we'll see more of those in the near future. What else is going on? Matt Foster saying that Chopard's salmon dial was cool, but too small at 36. That's fine, I've got another Chopard salmon dial for you that I think you will enjoy all the same. It will be bigger, it will be bolder, it will be man-sized, and yes, it will be everything you expect from a sports watch, but that's coming later in the show. We have Patel Philippe asking, is Chapek a one-trick pony? Certainly seems that way, given how the Antarctique has taken over the catalog, but let's not forget that they still have dress watches in multiple sizes. There's still the original Kedeberg. There is the, uh, the GMT Tourbillon, which is a spectacular piece, available in multiple different variants. We've got enough versions of the Place Vendôme Tourbillon and the Kedeberg dress watch. 
that if you don't want to get an Antarctique or Antarctique Retropont, you don't have to. And there are quite a few dial variants, so you're probably going to get one that suits you. You don't have nearly as many dial variants from brands that are maybe better diversified, but don't break up their production over so many different colors and case sizes. What else is going on? We have Turkish Hermeister saying, how about that Louis-Ulysse Chopard XPS. Good point. That's something we may have to talk about fairly soon. I'm also going to mention that we have a little note from Crafted Time saying it's his first time catching me live, and I appreciate that. We have No Erdi saying thoughts on the new El Primero 3652 with the seamless big date. I will later in the show. And then we've got Perpetual Time and P. Rao joining in. Welcome, guys. We also have Dave Mulligan saying his favorite at the show was the Pekinier Concorde Automatic. Definitely check out the folks from Morto making very impressive watches out of France these days. Okay, so I love, and I am in love, with the Chopard Alpine Eagle 41 XPS. Note, not 36, 41 millimeters, a spectacular salmon, small second, no date dial. The 2019 watch was attractive, but not an autologerie like to like rival against AP and Patek. The original watch played at a lower price point and a lower finishing point. Now, Chopard proves that less is more. The dial is cleaner, better balanced, simpler, brighter. And we have thickness reduced from 9.7 millimeters in the original, now 8 millimeters. The dial becomes a no date with small seconds, and that, I should say, is a across the board upgrade inside and out, because this one is a rival to Patek AP and Langa. For 2023, we have a Geneva hallmark treatment of the movement and the watch. Notice the seal is on both of them, because it is now a full watch standard of finish, fit, and materials. We have the hallowed stamp on the reverse side. It's a double certification watch as it's Geneva Hallmark, but the movement is also a COSC certified Swiss chronometer. We have stacked mainspring barrels, micro rotor, automatic winding with a 65 hour power reserve. On the XPS, the best features of the original watch return with a loomed dial, now featuring dial furniture in white gold, hardened and scratch resistant lucent steel, 100 meter water resistance, and a bracelet with all links removable, plus the extraordinary dial quality of that first Alpine Eagle is back in force. You need to see it to believe, trust me. These are spectacular and priced reasonably. We're still nowhere near what Long is asking for an Odysseus or Patek is asking for the new 5811 in white gold. But at $22,500, we have a respectably priced watch that I think under promises and over delivers. This Chopar does cost serious money, but it's also a serious rival to VC, Patek, AP, and frankly, the insufferable bundling you're going to be forced into if you want to get an Odysseus at a Langa boutique. I even think this plays well against some of the independents like the, well, the Chapek Antarctique. I think this is a watch that we're going to appreciate more with time now in what I believe to be its definitive version. Okay, viewer wrist shots number two. Mick R tracks the time at his office with the Rolex Oyster Perpetual 41 white dial. Rafat K hikes the mountains of Oman at altitude with his Tissot T-Touch Expert. We have Quentin B with his Rolex Air King, now discontinued, note it's the no-guard version, and his Montegrappa pen in combination. I'm a fan of both. And we've also got Abdul R of Germany, who waited 18 months for his Scottish-made Anordain Model 1 with teal enamel dial. It was time well spent. Ryan M. welcomes the arrival of his new Grand Seiko SBG or SBGH 271 Rika. And note, on a strap with a contrasting stitch, a green dial with contrasting gold, that Rika is incredible. A riot. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. All right, Marcos V joining in from Cypress, Texas. Richard Combs from South Florida. Tim Mancuso, our friend from our recent collector conversation, which by the way, Tim, we are now translating into Chinese 
for the Chinese version of YouTube called Billy Billy. So get ready, you're gonna be available around the world very soon. Just landed, he's in an Uber on his way back from Watches and Wonders. My brother will do it together next year, I promise. What else is going on in the box? David R saying, I waited only four months back in 2021 for my Anne Ordain Payne Gray. My have times changed. And we've got Caliber YQG saying, love the white dial OP. Too bad it was discontinued so fast. All right, jumping back, and by the way, we have a little note, rest in peace, Milgauss. May it return with a honeycomb dial and a rotating bezel. All right, watches and wonders, no Rolex, the adventure continues. JLC Reverso Tribute Duo Face Tourbillon. So back in 1994, JLC gave us our first dual-sided Reverso with a complication on each side. Two time zones, one watch, a rotating case. They're all time classic in its most practical form. Now, we're going up scale with a flying tourbillon. We have dual time with an AM PM on the remote reference dial, the famed reversible case with the reverse now in guilloche at the Métier Rare workshop inside of Jaeger Le Coult, where this is decorated the old-fashioned way by hand. The flying tourbillon here for you engineering boffins is exceptional. Note the balance sits entirely above the tourbillon carriage, which allows JLC to use a unique S-shaped overcoil to almost perfectly center the hairspring on this free-sprung balance in order to allow concentric breathing, perfect concentric breathing of the hairspring uncompromised by the roller table or the balance staff. You could easily miss it, but it is the most spectacular detail of this watch. Also note the mirror finishing of the tourbillon carriage itself with the mirror polish on the edge. You get what you pay for here. Also, you are looking at finish of the tourbillon, truly world class, executed by hand inside and out. This watch is the JLC of your dreams, and it's wearable. Because here's the thing, smaller than the concurrently released chronograph, the new chrono is 49.4 millimeters lug to lug and 29.9 wide, whereas this tourbillon is much closer to the old Grand Tie case at 45.5 millimeters lug to lug and 27.4 from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock across the case. Also, unlike a lot of previous dual time reversos, this one doesn't have a secondary pusher that requires a tool. All of the setting of both time zones can be done through the crown. Now, it's only a 38 hour manual wind power reserve caliber 847, but it's beautiful and you're gonna love interacting with this watch to wind it at the same time each day. It will be a treasured ritual. Rose gold only at the launch, but I wouldn't be shocked if they diversify that down the line. I'm not saying they're gonna make it available in steel, but platinum or white gold, definitely possible. Right now, it's available for $139,000, which is a lot of money, but you do get an outstanding eight-year warranty, so JLC's taking care of you. Okay, a blast from the past from JLC, a tourbillon reverso and a reverso with two time zones, but the real blast from the past, a glorious past, is the Chrono Swiss Delphus Oracle. I've been waiting years for the Delphus Jump Hour Retrograde to come back, and here it is, just after the passing of brand founder G.R. Long. He deserves credit for creating this watch because the original Delphus Retrograde Jump Hour was launched in 1996. You can see it helped to establish the design standards for both the model and the brand. For 2023, the Delphus is back with a rose gold case and a blue Flynn K translucent gradient enamel dial. So it's guilloche and then translucent fume fade enamel on top of that in blue. Truly special. Now, it is 42 millimeters in diameter with a 100 meter water resistance like the original, a surprising amount of water resistance for a rather dressy watch. The old Inacar caliber here is replaced with an automatic that boasts 55 hours of power reserve and it's got a slick ruthenium coat for a nickel anthracite contrast against the rose gold of the case. The Chrono Swiss Delphus, at least initially here, uh, the Oracle version is going to be a 50 piece limited edition at about 41,600 US dollars, but I do believe steel and titanium extensions of the line will follow for those comfortable with the watch, albeit at a lower price point. Jumping into the box to see what you guys are saying in real time. We have Thomas Burnett saying, I love jump hour watches. You and me both, my brother. We got 
caliber YQG saying love the Delphus jump hour. That new one is fire. And then we have Miroslav saying Chrono Swiss has amazing visual. It is poetic. Design Atelier joining in from Aruba. I love seeing where you guys are, especially when it's spread across the globe. Abdul R watches saying I had a vintage Chrono Swiss and I really enjoyed it. And Mark K, do you think the 321 Omega Speedmaster Ed White is worth getting on the gray market these days? If you like it enough, yes. If you are milk toast about it, then no. Remember, for that kind of money, especially the gray market price, you could probably find a caliber 321 Omega from the 60s. Something to think about and an alternative to consider. We have Philip Lynn saying Patek 6119 in rose opaline or white black. I like white black personally, but a lot of people are going to prefer the warmth of the rose, and neither one is wrong, but I'm more of a New York type guy. That's where I'm from. My heart might be in Southern California and South Florida, but I can't escape the fact that I'm from Long Island and I spent years working in finance in New York City, so I still prefer that understated look of white gold. What else? Aaron S. Hopefully this new Krona Swiss will get the brand back in the spotlight. And we've got Ophir M. saying, I think the Krona Swiss really found their niche in the last few years. So jumping back into the regularly scheduled program, I promised we'd talk about the new Zenith, and now we will. The Zenith Pilot Big Date Flyback, a tribute to the 1997 Zenith Rainbow Flyback that was actually built to satisfy a contract for French military aviation, so a rare modern era mechanical watch built for a military contract. While the new watch is not the first modern rainbow flyback tribute, that Stratos from the 2010s was the first modern rainbow tribute, uh, the new watch is the most unusual rainbow inspired watch that Zenith has offered. Despite color matching, it's a very different kind of timepiece than the 39 millimeter original. So the new watch is 42.5 millimeters in steel, has no rotating timing bezel, and sports a double date window that is supposed to be both flush and quasi-instantaneous jumping. The El Primero caliber 3652 packs 60 hours of power reserve here, automatic winding with a column wheel and lateral clutch, a high beat 5 hertz, that is 10 beat per second beat rate, and automatic winding. Now it is 100 meters water resistant, fully loomed and steel, so make no mistake, this is a sports watch. The rotor, and you can just barely see it here, is designed to resemble a cockpit's artificial horizon from an aircraft. So that's what that is right there. And the quick release mechanisms are actually integrated into the strap, which is nice, because it gives you quick release functionality, but preserves a conventional lug spacing, so you can use aftermarket straps with normal spring bars. A black ceramic model also is available, but for more money. I would say stick with the steel model. It's got more character. Pricing is going to be about $12,500 US dollars in steel or about $14,700 in ceramic. Again, I think that one is the one to get and a very agreeable timepiece. Something great to see from Zenith. All right, we got Detroit Spartan joining in. We've got Geezer. We've got Jared C saying, reminds me of Gerard Perigo, Rick on watch is saying, I have a hunch that Zenith looks better in person versus the renders. And I'm going to agree with you there. I'm going to suspend my judgment until I see it. And then we have Miroslav saying, the Zenith rainbow was worn by Furio in the Sopranos. Somehow I missed that one, but I'm not always up on my TV. I'm up on my watches, but not always on my prestige TV. Jay Wright is in the box along with Norm M. And we have Mark S. inquiring, better answers about what? Querying Norm M., who says Blanc Pan has better answers. All right, well, I look forward to hearing all about that, but we're not done with the LVMH watch group because Tag Heuer has a Carrera Chronograph Tourbillon that I think is actually awesome. Tag had a Carrera Chrono Tourbillon back in 2016, but it was huge at 45 millimeters and to many eyes, including mine, it looked too similar to an Hublot. So the 2023 60th anniversary Carrera Chrono Torb looks like a traditional Carrera, measures 42 millimeters in steel, and is far more likely to appeal to fans who prefer Hoyer to Tag. The flying tourbillon, as finished and presented, is quite attractive and purposeful. 
The celebrated Carrera angular integrated lugs are intact and correct, and the case offers a useful 100 meter water resistance rating, unthinkable when the first watch bowed back in 1963. An exclusive caliber features automatic winding, a 65 hour power reserve, and a column wheel chronograph with vertical clutch. Intriguingly, Tag Heuer is boasting that the addition of longtime Cartier watchmaking chief Carol Forestier to Tag's team has led to improvements in the finish, winding efficiency, and accuracy of the automatic Heuer 02 chrono tourbillon movement. And I look forward to seeing how they substantiate that because she is one of the most underrated watchmakers in the business with a legacy that stretches back to the original concept for the UN freak back in the 90s. So her impact on Tag Heuer could be spectacular and it officially starts here. One constant with the Carrera tourbillon series has been relative value considering the class of complication. And here you get automatic winding, the column wheel vertical clutch chronograph and the flying tourbillon in steel for 24,050 US dollars. Okay, we have lots of comments in the box. Abdul R saying just take our tag just take out the tag logo and that watch would be 50% more expensive, I think he's saying. We have David Mulligan saying, I prefer the old F1 livery to the watches. Okay, and we've got Detroit Spartan saying that one's a 100. We've got 23 Apasta saying Carol Forestier is awesome. And we have Lester Loves Watches saying, when a game of tag is each person reminiscing about Hoyer. Like that one. You will note that that Tag Heuer Carrera Chronograph Tourbillon features the so called Golf livery that graced cars from late 1960s Ford GT40s right up to the present day. It's subtle and appealing. It's a more attractive color palette than what we saw on previous versions of the Carrera Chronograph Tourbillon. Now, viewerist shots number three UDH and his Rolex Datejust 41 embrace high performance with the BMW M2 competition. Mark cruises in his Jeep Grand Cherokee with his Omega Seamaster Aquaterra bought from Billy at Watchbox. Thank you for trusting Billy and our company. We have Mufadal G ranges in his Rover with the Christopher Ward Bel Canto and Carl K of Ohio grills up a feast with his IWC Pilot's Watch chronograph. We have Sora P framing the cherry blossoms and his Tiso PRX in Kirkland, Washington. Send your shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. All right, Ed K we have Eric K. Torben a tag seems a waste. Jim Millet, Tag Heuer was the brand that got many of us hooked on watches in the 80s and 90s. Important to remember, it's where a lot of us did start. Geezer, Tim, thoughts on the FP Journe Francis Ford Coppola? Not really. The, the, the Francis Ford Coppola, the original one-off, struck me as a bizarre looking thing. Yes, F.P. Journe moves from category to category as he checks off his lifetime ambitions. And this is how he's tackling the automaton watch genre. The problem is, it's not attractive to my eye, and I know that I'm not alone in that regard. He'll have no trouble selling a few of them, so don't worry about it. He's going to make his money. But I think every time I see it, I imagine the Thanos Infinity Gauntlet from Marvel Comics, and I can't unsee it now that I've seen it. All right, we have Amit asking, Tim, favorite Cartier this year? Well, the micro rotor skeleton Santos simply stole the show, not just at Cartier, but maybe Watches and Wonders as a whole. All right, more non-Rolex fun from Geneva. I'd hate you to think I'm anti-Ublo. Quite the opposite here. And I give credit where it's due. In this case, the Ublo MP13 Tourbillon by axis by retrograde. So let's break that down. It's a spectacular grade five titanium, 45 millimeters, and sized to put its complication on display. That includes a biaxial flying tourbillon and a double retrograde with retrograding minutes and hours. So 
biaxial tourbillon, like something you might find on a Thomas Pressure or a Girard Perigo or a JLC. Sometimes they will add an extra axis, but this is not the kind of horology you associate with Hublot, longtime home of ETA and Salida movements. But we get those retrograding minutes hours, the biaxial tourbillon, a 96 hour power reserve with a power reserve indicator and the skeletonized caliber HUB 6200. Okay, in 2010, Hublot's longtime source for auto logerie, BNB Concept, went bankrupt and they had a decision to make. Either let them go bankrupt and lose their access to the haute horlogerie pieces that made up a minority but significant share of their image building collection, or buy BNB, preserve all that knowledge, keep those high end watchmakers and engineers employed, and they did the latter. They bought it and they brought it in house as the masterpiece division. Now, each year, these handmade, hand finished, high horology MP or masterpiece watches only account for two to five percent of Hublot's total volume, but it's wonderful to know that they continue to cultivate this kind of watchmaking in house. Only 50 pieces of this watch will be available, and I have to say $158,000 is a lot of money, but what would Richard Meal charge for this? I'm thinking raise that number by at least a factor of five? All right. Ulysse Nardin and the Freak One. We talked about Carol Forestier originally coming up with the idea of a watch movement surrounded by its mainspring, and that formed the root of the original 2001 Freak. Well, what we have here is a new take on the Freak. Rose gold and black titanium, 44 millimeters. It's an automatic, but it's also a traditional Ulysse Nardin Freak, which means this one is set using the bezel and it has no crown. So there's no setting crown as there was on the less expensive but controversial Freak X, who many considered, well I should say which many considered, to not be a freak due to the presence of the crown and the impossibility of setting with the bezel. So we have a freak that makes a return as a bezel setting watch with a baguette caliber, essentially the entire movement with the exception of the power source. There's your running gear. It is the minute hand. It's the drivetrain. It is a unlubricated anti-magnetic silicon escapement. It is an unlubricated anti-magnetic in-house silicon escapement made at UN's Sigatech subsidiary. The balance and the anti-magnetic hairspring are also made of silicon and also in-house and for good measure the whole thing is free sprung and hand finished. It is a automatic winder, the grinder automatic winding system makes a return. Yes, it's engineering, not a website and has a three day power reserve. You can see that this baguette acts as the minute hand of the Freak One. There it is being placed into position on the dial, which notably is loomed. And the Freak One is supremely attractive and fairly priced in my opinion. UN is once again newly independent, having been bought back by its management from its luxury group owner last year. So here the $68,600 price seems reasonable for the materials, engineering and exclusivity on offer. Let's see, we have Anthony N saying the Freak was so hot when it was first released all those years ago. And then we have Jared C saying this show is like librarian flexing. Thank you. And then we have Abdul saying amazing work of engineering but too large and I got to agree with you there. But I guess the size is needed due to the movement. If you want a smaller Freak your only choice is the original from 2001 which was 42.5. That was the first and last 42 millimeter range Freak. What else is going on here? We have Philip Lynn asking why do you think Francois from AP is stepping down? Politics. And then Noah saying, thoughts on the new Ingenieur? I want to like it, but it feels that it's missing something, especially with that price tag. Frankly, I love it. I love the size. I love the five day power reserve, the anti magnetism, the water resistance, the new aqua dial. I don't love the ridiculous price tag, and it is ridiculous. That's one to buy used. What else is going on? Richard S. saying, I just found this channel and live stream subscribed, hoping to learn so much and keep building my collection. Thank you, Richard. You make my job possible, so I'm truly grateful. All right, 
Glasuta Original, the Pano Inverse Limited Edition. Bold and controversial. Let's get closer with the cityscape engraving on both sides of the movement. Look closely and you will see the tiered skyscrapers of a densely packed modern city. Now this is based on the Pano Inverse dual side escapement and balance concept launched in 2008. It's the closest thing the modern Glasuta Original has to a design icon. This one is 42 millimeters in platinum and it features darkened rhodium coated bridges and plates. A really cool sort of microcosm of the city on the back. The buildings are incredibly well detailed and integrated. You can see little details like the name of the company, the number of jewels, the adjustment of the watch. There's a graffiti artist. There's a window cleaner. There are window air conditioners and it gets quite detailed. Definitely worth your time and attention with blued screws, black polished screws, beveled edges, jewels set in chiton, very traditional and yet avant-garde. I've seen inflamed opinions about this watch already on forums, so I predict it's definitely going to be a love-hate watch, but as Bob Lutz once said when he was the chief at Chrysler, if you create a love-hate watch, that means the people who love it will buy it, the people who hate it would never consider it. If you build a watch or a car, as Lutz would have said, that people merely like, you're not getting any guaranteed sales. So love-hate is the way to go with a boutique product, which this generally can be considered. They're only going to make 50 pieces, and the production run at about $46,700 should have no trouble selling out. Okay, viewer wrist shots number four, Tack W and his blue ceramic DeFi Classic. Take a look at the background. Report from the Great Wall of China. That's a first for us. Mohammed E and his Range Rover take the Rolex Datejust 41 for a drive in Kenya. Rob H is in South Philadelphia with his new Grand Seiko High Beat SLGH 013. Nicole and co worker, it's Ladies' Night on Watches Tonight, celebrate the virtues of Bulgari Serpenti at an office event. And Lawrence L takes us home with his Rainbow Cassioke in Waikoloa. Hawaii, guys, Hawaii, the Great Wall of China, Kenya. I'm spoiled for variety and geography in this wrist shot segment. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. And remember, open another window. Join me now on Instagram, Tim underscore Masso, to follow my upcoming trip to the New York Auto Show. Thanks to Sean for great work on the switcher tonight, and thanks to you for your participation in the chat box and for making my job possible. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.